All right, welcome everybody uh, again to the Cleveland Dot User Group. Today we have Tim Houlihan, one of our co-organizers, and he's going to talk about two things. So first, he's going to talk about um, contributing to open source and giving a good example of a uh, recent contribution he made. And then we're going to do an, try a new format where he's going to do an interactive data analysis. So he's going to pick out a data set and we're going to give suggestions. So it's a big kind of pair programming, but instead of a pair, it's sort of a group programming. Um, so take it away, Tim. All right. Well, we'll see how the pair programming goes with a pretty light audience today. <laughs> but we're, we're skewing uh, expert here with, uh, with the folks we've got. So that's good. Um, so actually, while I'm sharing and bringing this up, I, I looked back, John, and you talked about contributing open source. And I don't recall that. Uh, we've got video of it. So I'm not sure if I missed that event or whatnot. Uh, but it's been a couple of years, and it's kind of a good refresher beginning topic. So um, I still think it's it's good to cover. Uh, yeah, but also, I think your yours is more like a case study. Mine was very high level. So that's why I was interested in yours when you proposed it. Even though we talked at a high level, I think really seeing I did this step by step, I think it'll be really good. So I think they complement each other. Sounds good. Yep. Yeah, definitely. This is meant to show just because I hadn't done it in a while. And it's, it's so I kind of talk through like, yeah, rough edges and all that. Um, you'll need to uh, enable screen sharing for me, by the way. Yeah. Thank you for the reminder. Thank you, Koha. Did you? Uh, all right. All right. So, are you sharing the uh, presentation? Yeah, we can see it. Yep. I'm not going to put it in presenter mode because we'll jump around a little bit. Um, so I didn't put a bio slide in. I'm one of the organizers of the group. We can skip past all of that fun. Um, uh, I do work in consulting, running a practice in data analytics. Um, and for fun, I like to work with R. So um, start with the basics, you know, open source. Um, you can read this definition here, but obviously it uh, just means anybody can contribute to it. Um, and we'll talk about why you want to do that, but obviously, um, you know, it's a real advantage that that you're even able to do so. Um, some reasons to do that. I mean, you learn a new skill, you get to network in the community, you get to know folks. Um, you certainly demonstrate skills publicly, right? As opposed to uh, if you're working on a, you know, for a proprietary software house, um, you know, you just get to say, you know, I helped build XYZ subsystem in Windows if you work at Microsoft, but you're not going to, you know, talk about the open source part. Obviously, these days, uh, Plenty of other divisions within uh, Microsoft that do work on open source, but um, you get feedback from the dev community. Um, and frankly, in, uh, you get to work on software that you care about, right? And actually, like that can be a real practical need. Um, I think my first contribution was um, back when I was doing more just traditional software development as opposed to data. I was working on a mobile application in PhoneGap, and PhoneGap was pretty early at that point. And it just didn't do something I needed it to do. So actually just had a real practical need for um, modifying it. Once I'd done it, I thought I might as well contribute it back to the, to the community. Um, so in terms of getting started, obviously not all sources within GitHub, but these days, you know, the vast, vast majority is. So if you're not already uh, set up on GitHub, um, obviously that's important. There's really nice help and tutorial docs on GitHub for anybody not familiar. I would just add here, particularly for folks watching this later on video, um, that that's uh, a great area to get into. We'll use some Git concepts here today. So if you're not familiar, you want to look that up. But obviously, uh, the intent of the talk is not to, to teach Git. Um, so read the contribution guide for a project you're, you're interested in. Um, so for example, within the Tidyverse, which is where I contributed recently, uh, there's a contributing.md file. And it talks down through how you file a bug report or an issue, how you do pull requests, and all of these various types of things. Um, this is great even if you contribute to open source because, um, for all you know, um, you know a lot of these things can be specific to the project. Um, there's conventions for naming and all different kinds of things. Um, and let's face it, you're you know you're trying to be 
uh, respectful of the time of other people, particularly that are upstream, that that are going to evaluate your uh, contributions to uh, to have the basics covered. Um, they tend to be friendly if you mess up, but um, but if you're just consistently doing that and not having read the guide, um, you know, at some point you're you're kind of disrespecting the team there. Um, so looking for for issues that are marked good first issue is a best practice. So if we go when I say issues, you go in here into tidyverse. And you can look at the labels for them. You see a variety of different ones. These are all specific to project, but it's very common to see something along the lines of good first issue or good for beginners. Um, and these are ones that without a lot of you know, deep subsystem knowledge, you're gonna kind of be able to, to work on versus, um, so like let's pick out, you know, there's no performance ones. Whoops, that's so cool. Yeah, so you know, as a first timer, not knowing how this, some of this code works, getting into a deep performance issue within ggpod is probably more than you want to bite off. Um, also, look through the issue to see if there's any evidence that the issue has already been addressed. So I'm going to go to the pull request that I worked on. I reference the issue. So this was the original issue. So anybody, it's closed now, but let's say that this issue was open and you see, you know, commits towards it, comments, anything like that, then, you know, at least be aware, you might want to work on it for practice, but there are already folks that have uh, started to tackle that issue. Um, and so um, you may want to uh, pick a different issue. Um, and lastly, I mentioned, and in my case, that was the case, I just, had some time on the weekend, hadn't contributed in a while, and kind of was thinking about getting back into some of that to uh, dip my toe in the shell into the pool, looked for documentation issues, right? It's a nice, easy way to, um, to not have to worry about it yet, but just make sure, hey, do I remember how to do this and, and have those, that conversation? Um, so uh, we'll, come, we'll come back to that because we kind of walked through a case study. Uh, so best practices around this, you know, start small, um, communicate with the team as you're working on things, um, and, you know, don't make assumptions in your communications. Um, you're, you know, working with contributors around the world, um, different time zones, different response times, English may not always be your first language, just, um, you know, to, to definitely over communicate as you do. Um, focus first on the process. That's what I mean by you know, picking a documentation issue, right? Like you're probably not going to uh, flub up the documentation too bad, um, but you can you can uh, just get used to what you're doing. Um, and I would say, you know, picking a project, like literally picking any choice in life. I always think like picking something that you care about over something that's necessarily, you know, maybe you think is optimal for your next crew step or whatever else. If you care about it and you're interested in it, then you're going to keep, keep coming back to it. And that's a uh, uh, good first step to it. Um, check out previous pull requests to see if the process is smooth and the team's friendly. Um, there are <laughs> uh, places that you're going to get, you know, yelled at or not treated respectfully as a, as a first time committer. Um, I think that's pretty rare, but you can look through conversation prior to. Uh, um, uh, prior to doing that, just to make sure that's okay. And one second, hear why I text my family to ask my kids to stop screaming in the back of the call. I don't know if you guys are hearing that or not. Apologies if you are. Um, and then uh, step away if you can't be friendly. Like any sort of volunteer work, if folks do it too long, um, you know, you can uh, uh, get to the point where you get frustrated with new people or people uh, with dumb questions. And, um, at the end of the day, this is something you're doing for fun and to, to be a part of the community. Um, all right, so let's jump over to, to what I took a look at. So this uh, first one, um, it was uh, so it's called this clarify full range equals true extends the access limits, not the whole plot. So um, in this case, the, um, oops, and this wasn't bad, um, a bad description, but uh, I would say like reproducible examples are always great. They talk about that in the contributions um, where you're filing issues um, or has some really nice uh, tools around creating reproducible examples even. 
um, I believe John Stemmer Ghost in Empire Talks. But um, in this case, um, if you're adding a smoothing line to your plot and um, you wanna make it go all the way to the end of the line, uh, use this full range equals true. Um, and th this person's suggesting that um, it will not go into the padding configured by ex expansion, just being clear on that. Um, and so my very first one, um, I edited a file directly <laughs> as opposed to where it's supposed to be generated. Um, and the nice thing was without even seeing that, um, when I created uh, uh, a PR, it passed, um, let me see if you can see it better in here. Uh, where's the closed one? Yeah, this one here. So. Tim, could you zoom in on your browser? Yeah. Um, either is that good enough or do you want to that's good okay um so it's weird i'm not i like yeah here we go this is what i was looking for um so you get some breaking code checks when i even just created the pull request so before anybody even commented it i knew that there was there was issues i think this is the screen where i could see yeah i click on it pretty clearly and see So I think I show it maybe over in here. Yeah. yeah but um, so regardless, the the there were some warnings there, but the um, the diff amongst other things. You could see. Sorry, let me go back. Oh, I'll, the text tab will show it. Um, so. So I'm not finding the exact message, but the, the, the point being on one of these tests, it warned about like you didn't have the, the initial header file um, where you're or supposed to do the change and, and it was a hand edited uh, file was effectively what I did. So um, using uh, Roxygen, if that's pronounced <laughs> or if it's R Oxygen or whatever, but the, uh, so using the, the comments up above to specify the change and then you do it, uh, um, dev tools document. That's how you're supposed to do this. And so I went ahead and closed the request, but then nicely afterwards, um, I got a comment here in conversation. So one of the maintainers jumps in and says, you know, explains uh, what I've done. So yeah, I, I closed the test, closed it. <clears throat> um, I could have kept working on it and pushed against this pull request, by the way, um, but uh, just for cleaner history, like I knew what it was. It was a very simple change. It was easier to close out the, the PR, do a new branch and make the change properly. Um, so here, um, I do that more correctly, go in here. And so, yeah, here's the format you see of the, the comment. Um, down here at the bottom, where we see the smoothing line gets explained, uh, gets expanded to the range of the plot, potentially beyond the data. This does not extend into any additional padding created by expansion. Then for the contribution guidelines, you also need to put a line into news.md. So is this just you know effectively release notes of what's changed when uh, when things come out. Created the pull request for that, submitted it, and, and it goes from there. Um, and we don't have to go nuts on this, but I will say like one thing that, um, so documentation changes, you'll see GitHub mention if you're in, in a, one of the guides I read that was just bumping back up on this. Um, when you create a, a fork, you could just for a real simple documentation change on a project where it was truly a text file, edit it on GitHub and then in browser and then do a pull request. Um, the, uh, because of, the nature of the documentation generation on this project, and I would say most of our projects, you would need to go ahead and, and create a local copy of that. Um, so I thought, while again, we're not going deep into Git, it's worth going through what the workflow of that is like. So if this is the project you wanna work on, 
Um, actually, I just realized, uh, yeah, it's okay. Um, you go to the fork. In this case, I won't actually hit it because um, I already created one on mine, but as a member of Clean Our User Group, I could create a fork there. You can change the description if you want, you hit create. At that point, you have your own copy of it. So in my case, you can see here, this is the fork that I've already created. And then what you wanna go ahead and do is copy that and then get clone. I'm not gonna do it here because I'm already in the directory, but you're cloning from your forked version. Just by habit, because that's how it's always done, I've always added then an upstream um, for that. And the idea being, if my fork is out of date, I can do git pull master, and you can get any changes. Oops, upstream main, I'll just get the, the change. We'll have it die hard. And now you've pulled in any upstream changes. Git will also let you do that right here so I can fetch upstream. Um, so oops. Um, the reviewer did give some uh, additional feedback. The, um, so this was, um, I may not be able to see this terribly well. I don't know if I can zoom in. Um, oh, I had a warning. Uh, so there was just a package not installed. And then there was a um, additional comment on, who was this one here, sorry. Yeah, so they asked for uh, a tick mark around true and um, a minor rewarding change, right? So at that point, though, you know, it was those were minor commits, committed those against the pull request, and then the entire pull request was merged. So obviously, like we talked about, just communicating, keep a friendly attitude with when you get those tweaks, and you're good to go. Um, so then a couple days later, I thought, well, let's try this again. Um, so went into another issue um, that uh, this one was a little more interesting. Again, um, we'll come back to the same theme here, but let me zoom back out just a touch. Um, so this person says, today I was surprised by the following. I wanted to compute proportional densities of two groups. This is doable using y equals after stat of count over the number of rows of the data frame, but I had pre-computed n for the number of rows of the data frame and used it below. Uh, and so um, effectively, so after stat does, um, after you've computed the densities and this person um, was surprised that their n was recomputed. And then that was a, an output of in the local scope of there. Um, the, and I think it got cut off here, but the other part of the issue that they were concerned about was that it references that after stat, the, the current documentation wording has that after stat only has those computed variables in scope, when is, which is, it's just meaning that it has masked any higher scope with those global scope is still available. So if you have, a, have a, a variable that's not computed in after stat, you can still, of course, reference outer scopes. So once again, this comes down to documentation. So um, once again, it's an easy change we can fix. So I'll try to zoom out the code better here. So yeah, you see originally this is saying um, 
evaluation after scaling will only have access to the final aesthetics of the layer, including non-mapped default aesthetics. Um, the original layer can only be accessed at the first stage. And so um, we have data to, to say uh, after evaluation after the stat transformation, we'll have access to the variables calculated by the stat, not the original mapped values. Uh, and evaluation after scaling will only have access to final aesthetics layers, including not mapped. The original data layer can uh, layer can be accessed by the first stage. So it's um, and then included in this that n was missing as one of those calculated variables. So you now know that if you had n defined, you're going to get that over it. Um, this one, I created the pull request, asked for some feedback on it, and they merged it. So uh, feedback was a simple yes. Um, so how do you go about finding a project to work on? Um, talk about uh, something we've talked about recently a lot on the Saturdays, often comes up with questions. And that's going to uh, CRAN and or the uh, package view and, and um, task views. So open those up. Um, again, ideally, you'd work on something that you're kind of already familiar with. Um, but one, you can get a list of just all packages or you go to these task views and look for something like. Uh, if you're interested in spatial libraries or any of these other things. Um, so in my case, where it was ggplot, if you had not much idea of where to get started with that and didn't just search on get out, oops. There we go. You can go to the CRAN page and then you will find your URL here for source. Uh, so you can get an idea where to go to. Um, and readme and news, so actually, if you recall, like this has the notes from those changes that we talked about. Um, so eventually, you know, uh, the comments I made in that news file would, would make their way into this. So as we talked about here, it's getting there. Um, I called out, especially for we we kind of already went through that um, mainly here, just highlighting that um, you know you either need to do the upstream if uh, if, it's, if you've left your fork around for a while, or you can frankly just delete the fork uh, if you have no you know if you're not going to be working on it for a while and then come back to it. The, um, I had originally planned this as we could do a live demo of one. Um, I sort of think because of the exploration of the other one, we'll, we'll leave that for now, but maybe that's a, maybe that could even be a fun Saturday morning idea would be that uh, we we'll group code through a, an open source issue. So questions, comments? Books in my packages that you're welcome to fix, Tim. In a Saturday. <laughs> yeah, lots of easy documentation issues for me to dip my toe into. Um, all right. Yeah, I think I just reinforced a lot of what Tim said. Um, definitely documentation, and it doesn't just have to be issues. If you've used a package to solve a problem, sometimes document like you documenting that for the person so that others can see it, so they don't have to answer that question over and over again, right? If you know you've used a package in an in an interesting way, um, those are the sort of things I always appreciate, right? Like, I don't I don't have any plans on using it for that use case, but if you know how to do it and you can explain it to others, that's a great um, contribution. That's interesting. I didn't even like. Uh, you know, I was thinking of documentation issues as like those kinds of small, just unexpected behaviors. But like, have, are you thinking like document like a vignette of a maybe a use case that uh, mm -hmm. 
of a unique scenario. That's an interesting concept. Yeah. So like for, to give an explicit one, it's like if I work for the line, there's lots of ways to deploy the websites, right? So someone will come up with some really fancy way to do really their requirements, right? And it's like, that's great. You know, share it for other people to do it, right? Like we don't, I don't need to, we don't need to mess with the code for that. You can just document how, how they set it up, right? In, in the steps. So. I'd also like to mention, uh, oh, sorry. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, Tests are a good contribution. Um, if, if there's something that, uh, you know, if there's a test that you think might be missing, uh, that's one good thing. And uh, when I was uh, contributing to a, a package recently, um, the author suggested a, a, a good strategy uh, for formatting your pull request which is to write the tests first before you fix anything. That way, when they, you know, run that commit, they can see all the, everything that's failed. And then they, you get your fix in there and then the tests obviously should pass after that. Um, so I, I was, you know, making the fix first and then writing the tests afterward. Um, but it is good to see, uh, why when they fail just so you can you know post post more to analyze what what went wrong yep that's great yeah that's your, that's your good advice i thought another thing tim that that you didn't mention is that to make it easy as possible for them to merge it you want to try and sort of like mimic their style whether it's the documentation or the code or anything you want to make it look like they wrote it right so if they do something yeah. weird they do something weird where they put the, you know, semi, not a semicolon, but like the curly brackets in a weird place that you don't like, you just do it like they do it. Cause if it looks like they wrote it, then they're going to merge it. <laughs> um, yeah. Particularly for, yeah. If you're uh, for code, especially if you're getting into, uh, yeah, whatever their code style guide is, what, like the, usually I would think that would be covered in the contribution guide to point you to that. Um, but yeah, it, it definitely, that's true down to the message level, right? Like, um, and I forget how closely I looked, but usually like as a consultant, when I'm going in with a new org, I always look at their commit messages just to get a sense of like, you know, am I following the pattern of, okay, linking to the issue I, I uh, fix here and, um, and what level of summary do you want to do? Because I always struggle with like <laughs> my default comment is usually whatever the commit message was in the first place it's kind of like well i already said this once but like you want to make sure you're saying it in a way and obviously the nice thing here is by referencing the issue number if i have any question about what problem is this solving you know it's convenient i can jump right to it um, and obviously then github does you the favors of then um, you know tying that behavior back down in the messaging so it's easy to jump around too 